We're here. It's time. Flight of the Jedi. Three parts. Wes, punch it. Go. of your host eric eilerson and joining me tonight on our long-awaited light of the jedi roundtable is the full house of hosts we got dr Corey helton hey man what's up ready to talk jedi ah, old republic Fight. high republic whatever the hell this is ah! <laughs> we also got dr charles hankel hey dude how do i have the same level of energy uh jazz fingers i don't know hey. <laughs> Oh my God, perfect, perfect. And of course, rounding us all up, the ball of energy, the light, the fire, the sea of the force, Wes Jenkins. What's up, everybody? I finished the book. I finished the book before yes. round table. Yay! <laughs> <Atta> boy. <Amazing. laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, welcome to all of you listening, watching all of you in the chat here tonight. We are so, so stoked to give you our first part of our three-part round table on Charles Soule's Light of the Jedi, the first novel of the High Republic. Long awaited, well reviewed, and cannot wait to talk all about it. But before we do, just a couple of things. We're going over to Patreon first, because we want to welcome Kyle Cormacan, which is a Star Wars name if I ever heard one. He's a smuggler off Corellia. Kyle Cormacan, welcome to the Utini Patreon. We're happy to have you here. I hope this energy is going to make you not uh, quit. Uh, additionally, if you're on our Patreon and you're sticking around with us, this Friday evening, the four of us are going to get together, probably have some libations, <clears throat> and watch the 1999 classic. George Lucas directed The Phantom Menace. That's right. Episode one commentary coming your way. Fellas, how stoked are you about this? We're going to oh, watch Phantom Menace together. Joke. We've never done this. Super stoked. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Know, we've never, we've I never watched a... We watched. Uh, we did a watch party with uh, like the whole team one time and watched Revenge of the Sith. We've never watched just the four of us a movie. It's gonna be fun. We're getting yeah, really I drunk, think... right? Yeah. Uh, it's night. All right, relax, man. Maybe some of us <laughs> just want to watch the movie. Collect shots by the time we hit the boo. <laughs> uh, but we'll have a great time again. If you're a member of Patreon at any level, you'll get access to that. We're so excited. Uh, Charles, you did such a, a frankly fantastic job reading with your lovely melodious voice our patron of the week last time would you mind doing that again for us this week yeah man thank you for complimenting my voice so i didn't have to uh this <laughs> week we are reading from maggie aka to millennial falcon in our <laughs> discord yeah, yeah. and uh maggie says hey i'm maggie i'm from south carolina me too and I got into Star Wars as a little kid. Hey, me too. My dad got me and my brother out of school on the release day for each of the special edition theatrical releases in 1997, and I've never looked back. I've seen every movie since opening night. Oh, every movie since on opening night. I found the books through my middle school library and a stray copy of Rogue Squadron, and it was on. Our local bookstore is next to the grocery store, so while my parents shopped, I would wander next door to find my next EU adventure. As far as favorites go... It's always going to be Leia. She loses everything, her parents, her planet, her brother, her entire family, and has every reason to despair, but she only grows more determined. Her journey from plucky princess to respected leader and ultimately general and master is told in every medium, movies, comics, and books, and I love them all for what they explore about her. Tatooine Ghost has a soft spot in my heart for letting us see Leia get to know her grandmother and Anakin through Shmi's journal. I found Utini through the podcast, had a long commute, and went looking for something Star Wars to listen to. I found the Queen Shadow Roundtable episodes and decided yeah! to try. Nice. I haven't missed an episode since. You guys are genuine, and just to have such a love for the universe and watching it every week just reminds me of how I feel about our galaxy far, far away. Joining Patreon was an easy decision. The community fostered by Utini is so positive and welcoming. Who wouldn't want to join? I can't think of a question for our host, so I'll just say thank you for this community and for what it means to those of us in the Utini fam. Wow. Thank you, Maggie. And that's exactly what we are. We're a Utini fam, and we're glad you're a part of it. Here, Absolutely. Here. We see you in the chat as well. Maggie is here tonight, so a special hello, hello. Uh, ah, 
That's lovely. It's so great. Those Patreon of the Weeks, I feel like, started as a way to, like, highlight our patrons, but it's just us making ourselves feel good every week as well. So I'm not going to lie. It's pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> now, just moving right along with this show, because Charles, as we said last week, has how many pages of notes to get through in three weeks? I think I said 13, and I lied because it's 14. <laughs> oh, Charles, please stop lying to our listeners. Uh, but we are still going to go quickly because we have time for a Star Wars Weekly Roundup. I don't have the cool effects that Corey had. Corey, can you intro the Star Wars Weekly Roundup with your effect? Yes, can you do that? I can. Welcome to the Star Wars Weekly Roundup. Awesome. God. I, I'm going to listen to that every single morning. Uh, this okay. week on, in the Star Wars world, we got some cool High Republic news because we got the first episode of the High Republic YouTube show. It was fantastic. It was like 25 minutes long. It had a new character video for Bell Zetafar. Those animated shorts they've been doing for the High Republic are amazing. They had a roundtable discussion with Charles Soule and Justia Ireland. And we got some cool new character reveals, including Ola Jorini, the way seeker from Claudia Gray's Into the Dark, out tomorrow. And we found out the name of the protagonist of The Edge of Balance, the manga coming out, which is Lily Tora Asi. And we also <laughs> found out that Stellan Geos, who we've met already, and a new Wookiee named Arkoff, a Wookiee Jedi, are going to be starring in that manga as well. So, Corey, could you throw some of those character pictures up on the screen for our friends at home? Yes. Read them to me again because you're going fast. <clears throat> I'm going so fast. I'm, I'm charged. This is Orla Jarini. She is a Wayseeker Jedi in Claudia Gray's Into the Dark. She is Umbaran. And she's got that sweet, hinged white lightsaber, like Dark Ray. You guys see that? Yeah, I think it's sweet. And I don't I don't really know if this is this thing original. Like, have we ever seen this before in a in a Star Wars work, like before uh the Rise of Skywalker? I mean, it's pretty it's pretty creative. Uh I think the the temple guards have something similar. Um oh, okay. but I don't know if they ever use it in that like double uh yeah. configuration. Sure, totally. Yeah, we got her. And then who we got next on the slides? There we go. Lily Tora Asi with those awesome like sword lightsaber hilts. Those things are dope as hell. They're pretty yes, cool. They are super cool. Somebody pointed out pretty hilariously there's literally no reason whatsoever for them to be hanging on her belt like that so i wonder if they're gonna <laughs> i wonder if they're gonna address that because there's like they're like sticking out of her hips yeah i think what they are is uh, awesome <laughs> and they look cool <laughs> maybe they're uh, magnets so we'll yeah so we'll see how that goes uh and then next up we got i believe who's up next on our slides here in our uh, grand old go, reveals oh yeah so this is another announcement this is Stellan Geos doing his best Moon Knight impression in the upcoming Star Wars <laughs> Life Day Treasury. That's right, y'all. We are getting a new anthology book from George Mann. Uh, so very myths and fables, dark legendsy. But he's being joined by his best friend, Kevin Scott. That's right. Kevin Scott is going to be writing these stories with George. And Grant Griffin is bringing up the art, as we see on screen here. And y'all, it's getting eight stories about Life Day. Look at those Ewoks in the snow. Look how cute they are. Yes. That's amazing. And that scary looking Wampa monster thing in the background, I think this probably is. is I what that just, is? I've looked at this all. Yeah, it totally is. I didn't even see that. I thought Me that neither. was a tree. <laughs> yeah. Demon. That's sick. <laughs> yeah. So that's going to be coming out in September, which, then, uh, lastly, we have I don't know. There's Arkoff. There's our, look at this buff Wookiee Jedi. He's like burly. <laughs> yeah, He's a burly boy. <laughs> <laughs> but he's going to be in the, in the manga as well. Which is super fun because I know uh, Stellan Geos is going to be in that. He's also going to be in Rising Storm. I, I like how they're taking characters and kind of like putting them in a bunch of different works at the beginning. So we're, we're really getting a lot of depth in each uh, kind of different medium for these guys. So very stoked about that. If y'all have not seen the first episode of the Higher Public show, you got to check it out. It's so good. It's so fun. Christina Ariel did an amazing job hosting. And I believe that's going to be a monthly show. It's going to have exclusive reveals like this. That's where we find out about the new book, about the new characters, stuff like that. Um, and it's going to have more interviews with a lot more writers, a lot more creators. It's going to be very, very fun. And, of course, as a reminder, you can find all the releases they talk about on that show at our website on our new releases page. Uh, most notably, of course, tomorrow, as we're recording this, Into the Dark by Claudia Gray comes out February 2nd. Reviews are going to be up on Utini tomorrow. The written review, uh, which was written by our very own Meg Dowell, and the video review will be on our YouTube channel, done by our very own Emma. 
One more announcement that we want to go over. Uh, our We Arch All the Republic giveaway is still technically going on right now. That's our fan art uh, kind of contest we've been having for your very own High Republic sketches in order to win some cool Utini merch as well as an exclusive Light of the Jedi copy. And have y'all been seeing these on Twitter? There's some awesome entries already. I'm loving them. Have you seen these? Yes. yes they, they, look, they look super good. And <clears throat> we said last week... Um, we said last week that we were considering opening up to international. We got a huge, huge response too that we are definitely need to do that. So we did open it yeah. up to internationally. So uh, welcome, international folks. Uh, we always, you, you dumb, we dumb Americans. We always forget how uh, <laughs> how big our international community is. It is pretty large, and we have a lot of really talented artists. So, um, yep. Don't let that hold you back from entering. Yeah, the artwork has been fantastic so far. It's so much fun seeing these come in. Yeah, really, really freaking love them. Keep them coming. Uh, and as a reminder, entries are accepted until February 4th. Uh, and then public voting will come on February 5th. Again, keep your eye on the Utini underscore US Twitter account where we will announce all that. And next week on this very podcast on the 8th, we will announce the winner with, of course, 48 hours to respond, yada, yada. <sighs> very excited. Very excited for all your cool stuff. Now, at this point in the show, we would do book reviews, but... That's what this show is. It's a giant book review of Light of the Jedi. So we're going to skip those for now and go straight to our baller new merch ads. Can we please throw that up on the screen to show the great people what they can get from the Utini store? What an ad. Yes, Jose has been hard at work um, uh, being in a metal band as well, apparently. Uh, but designing all these great shirts. I uh, can't see it quite behind the mic, but I am wearing my uh, my great disaster. Two, that's the wrong way to go. Here we go. My 232 BBY uh, great disaster light of the Jedi shirt. And um, we get two other shirts we revealed there. We have the Ray Lowe shirt, which, Corey, I want you to talk about in a sec. But we also have the We Are All the Republic shirt, which is my my personal new favorite. It has We Are All the Republic written in Arabesh. And also all the lines there are the colors of the lightsabers by the numbers of all the Jedi we've met so far in the High Republic. Like, That's Jose awesome. went out of his mind on that shirt. Yeah. <clears throat> so here are, the, here are the two shirts. Um, that one is the the We Are All the Republic shirt. It's got all the lightsabers on there. Um, this is the Raylo shirt. Those are yes, those are in fact my two dogs, uh, Ray and Kylo. Um, funny story about that about that shirt. In case you missed our, in case you missed our Christmas party this year, someone they made that for me and gave it. Excuse me. They made it for me and gave it to me, um, and uh, it's it's my favorite. My wife loved it though, and she stole it, so I had to get Jose to send me another one. <laughs> <laughs> and now you can have them. There there are now multiple animal shirts. You get your Morton shirt. You get your Raylo shirt. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, the other puppies are are only too soon to follow, but yeah. all that stuff is up right now. And uh, I gotta say, I am I'm loving what we're doing. But I yeah. gotta, I gotta be honest. I'm also so freaking excited for official High Republic merch to come. Whether that be shirts, whether that be like we've gotten the socks, we got the pins. Like, if you guys could pick one piece of High Republic merch, this will be the last thing we talk about before we get into the book. Uh, well, maybe not the of- last thing, Eric. Because we forgot, we, we forgot to talk about one of the merch items that huh. apparently has gone out that only our Patreon crew knows about. And well, did we? <laughs> I am currently wearing this 
Oh my god. Corey didn't see when <laughs> oh I Oh my god. When we started oh my god. Out. But this is uh, this is my I cool hat shirt. I cannot believe you got that shirt already, Wes. Good god <laughs> almighty. I made uh, sure that I got the most obnoxious color, so I got purple, and then oh my it's god. really good on this yellow face this is background. My pool hat. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the lie, Corey? Where's the lie? Oh my god. That is Oh my gosh. In case incredible. if you are if you are not one of our, our patrons, you missed out on the quite inebriated experience that was my read through of I Jedi and <laughs> Somehow it turned into a bit that I wore a bunch of hats. I don't know how that happened, but I had a lot of hats. I had Caitlin go find all the hats in our house. And I just wore them all. And that one that Wes has is my pool hat because, of course, Jose turns it into a flipping shirt. Of course. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, I don't know. Can we even go on from that? Like, what? Do you, other than the pool hat shirt, which is the epitome of fashion, of class, of everything the world wants to be, what would you guys want? And high republic merch obviously i'm funko pops i'll just i'll just admit what you're all thinking i want my high republic funkos mm -hmm. what do you guys mm -hmm. want first <clears throat> i want i want lightsabers like Ooh, any yeah. of the lightsabers like any of them like like we have all the traditional lightsabers like you have the ahsoka lightsabers on your wall above you eric um but like of that of that style and that quality i would love to get like like maybe one with the leather. I haven't oh, seen all the yeah. lightsabers, but something with like leather on it. it looks very old Republic. That would be sick. Yeah, that would be amazing. Uh, West Charles, what do you guys think? Well, you know, um, I, I wrote this down as a quote, and we'll talk about it later. But um, Martian Rose gloves. I'd like Ooh. one like a big glove, like a Hulk hand that holds my beer. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. That's oddly specific. Yes, it is. Um, and I will take any any of the Nile masks. Any Ooh, of them. Ooh, that's yeah. a good oh, one yeah, too. Yeah, 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 that's a great one. Yeah, that's very responsible. <laughs> Wear your Nile masks out in the store. People will stay six yeah. feet away from you. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's fan it. All right. Fantastic. Well, on that note, let us now. Uh, Let's just get on with the show, shall we? Let us, Charles, you have all these parts. You have all these notes. I'm so excited. <laughs> Folks all around the world, Light of the Jedi, round table, part one, engage. Charles, go! Part one, here we go. All right, y'all, we're going to do things a little bit differently this time around in that we're going to talk about what happened in this story point by point before we start getting to any of the prompts. So here we go, a plot synopsis of Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule. So the book opens with a great disaster when a ship called the Legacy Run is taking a group of refugees to a new planet. However, there's suddenly something in the hyperspace lane within which it's flying, and though the captain tries to avoid it, the ship can't take the stress, and it breaks apart. We cut to several people around the galaxy going about their daily lives when suddenly pieces of the destroyed ship enter the sector of space and wreak havoc, killing nearly everyone. One world in particular, Hetzel, is able to raise the alarm and reach out to the Jedi to ask for assistance. Jedi Master Avar Chris arrives aboard a Republic Defense Coalition ship and together with other Jedi manages to save the system from certain destruction. Cut now to the Nile, a group of marauders in the Outer Rim led by Marky and Roe who helps them all pull off near impossible jobs with the use of secret hyperspace lanes called paths. Meanwhile, the Republic is able to get to the bottom of the mystery of the legacy run and realizes that many pieces of this ship have yet to emerge from hyperspace and will undoubtedly cause further destruction. With the help of a young tech genius named Kevin Tarr and a network of thousands of Navidroids, the Republic is able to figure out how to predict these emergences and move to capture the piece containing the flight recorder to provide more answers as to what happened. However, a group of Nile have the same goal. A second group of Nile is sent to the planet Elfrona to capture a family and ransom them off. Little do they know, a group of Jedi, including Loden Greatstorm and his Padawan Bel Zedifar, are at the outpost and are contacted to stop the Nile. A major battle ensues that puts all Jedi involved to the test. Nearly every family member is saved, but Loden ultimately finds himself captured by the Nile. 
A second major battle between the Nile and Republic forces is occurring over the flight recorder, but rather than save his troops, Marky and Roe uploads hyperspace routes to the Nile ships that send them all smashing into their enemies, killing everyone. Marky and Roe reassembles the Nile and uses their recent losses to inspire them to a new mission, to amass their forces and move from the outer rim to the rest of the galaxy. Back on Roe's flagship, Loden Greatstorm sits in a prison for unknown purposes. Chancellor Lena So's Starlight Beacon, a new Republic space station, is officially brought online. Many Jedi have assembled there, including Avar Chris, who will now take the mantle as leader of the Starlight Beacon's Jedi Temple. Following the ceremony, Chris's compatriot, Elzar Mann, has a terrible force premonition detailing suffering and death across the galaxy by the hand of what seems to be Marky and Roe wielding a new, unknown, yet ancient weapon. And nice. there you have Round it, of Light of the Jedi. For Charles in the chat. Yes. Nice, yes. absolutely, dude. Two minutes or less. <laughs> oh my goodness, I am. That's it, man. I don't know what to nice. say. Thank you. Wow, uh, guys, let's go around. Let's rate this book on a one to ten scale. Again, I know you're excited, Eric, but don't say why just yet. Just give me the number, and we'll come back around at the end. So, Eric, why, why don't you kick us off? All right, Charles. If I had to rate Light of the Jedi, <laughs> I would give it a perfect 10 out of 10. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that was Marcia and Roe or Bernie Sanders, to be honest. <laughs> well, one's the young version of the other. That, that's my Marcia and Roe. 10 out of 10. He would, or he would be say... wearing mittens if it was Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> also, did Fantastic. Totals. Fantastic. 10 out of 10. All right. Wow. Uh, no pressure. Wes, what do you think? Well, I did not listen to the audiobook on this one. I read it, and I wish I had read it and listened to the audiobook because of all the praises that y'all gave. Um, but I will give it I will give it a 9.8. Mm, that's it high. That's the highest very, you've ever rated a book, I believe. Wow. Very, <laughs> very good. So if you all listen to the podcast a lot, you would know that is the highest ranking Wes has given the book in quite some time. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, but Corey, (laughs) I am also going to give Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule a perfect 10 out of 10. Let's go! Let's go! Awesome. Charles, 7.1. I I am going to lowball it for... uh, for the sake of lowballing, and I'm going to give it a 9.5. 9.5? Yes. Charles, Whoa. but we all yes. know it <laughs> will be coming at, up by the listen, end of the round. I ha- exactly. I have to leave space to come up by the end of this Man, three hours right. of talking about yeah. this book. Yeah, guys, guys, listen to low ball great storm over here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's better than no balls great storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, on that note, <laughs> let's jump into no. the characters portion of this Real, round okay. table, y'all. I'm, I'm already going to interrupt. I already have oh, to interrupt. God. All right, Charles, <laughs> I want I want to talk about the pronunciation of Martian slash Markian Row because yes. the chat right. is okay. going to bring this up a bunch of times because yep. there is a lot of inconsistency, and you have explained this there better is. than anybody. Can you explain this a little bit really okay. fast? Yeah, so this is interesting, and it's one of those things, you know, uh, Han and Han, I guess you could say, because the audiobook for Light of the Jedi says Martian Row every time with the sh sound. Um, so that's Mark Thompson's, you know, reading of that name. However, the person who created the character, Charles Soule, specifically says Markian Row in all of his interviews and actually in the most recent uh, High Republic uh, show that came out, mm-hmm. they also said Marky and Roe every time they they questioned Charles Soul. So I just happen to like how that sounds better, and I'm gonna be saying that. And I think it makes sense mm-hmm. to say what came from the creator of the character. But say Martian if you want. I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I will yeah. probably and say from- Martian accidentally because I, I mostly listen to the audiobook, and I mm-hmm. I will probably default to Martian. But I, th- I think there's a wrong pronunciation. That's what's fun about. Star Wars names, yeah. they're all impossible to freaking sound out. Yeah. I just, yeah, for- every time I say Martian, I think of Marshawn, and then I just think of, of Martian <laughs> Rowe showing up to the Nile and being like, I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so that's why, that's why I choose Mark. Yeah. Uh, oh, great reference. But also, for more info on that, uh, when we talked to Mark Thompson in our interview last year, uh, 
which is in uh, I believe in our YouTube channel and all of our uh, podcast links. He talked extensively about that. We asked him if he if he chooses the pronunciation or he gets a guide. So check out the interview. He goes into it uh, in a lot of detail. That's all I got. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's hop into some character talk, y'all. There are a metric ton of new characters in this book, and we're undoubtedly going to see them get fleshed out more as we get more High Republic material. But first, I actually want to take a step back, and I want to focus on the factions within which those characters are operating. And then we can talk about some individuals. And the first people I think we have to talk about in a book called Light of the Jedi is the Jedi. Mm-hmm. And so the Jedi in this novel were both familiar and unique, I think. They felt similar to Jedi that we see in the prequel era. Uh, in fact, there are a couple that were actually from the prequel era. And on the other hand, they, they felt a lot more pure, like an intense version of what we saw in the prequels. What was your impression of High Republic Jedi compared to what we've seen before? That's a good Ooh. question. Uh, they, I think they... I don't think they quite felt okay. So I think there's going to be a lot of comparisons to like the Bane novelization or the Bane trilogy, right? Like as we talk mm-hmm. about this stuff, because that's the old Republic. That's like some of the best old Republic contents have been created. Uh, and I think the Jedi are very different in this book than they are in the Bane trilogy. Like, in fact, they're more flawed and, and stuff in the Bane trilogy. Like you can see the reflections mm-hmm. of a lot of the stuff that happens in the prequels in the Bane trilogy. So, I mean, I like what you said. They're, pure intense versions of them they do seem truer perhaps like they marketed this whole thing as like the knights of the round table and it certainly felt like that to me Mm -hmm. yeah i think this the jedi in this era are really defined at least as far as how soul talks about it in interviews and how he shows it in this book by how they listen to the force i mean yoda is unique in the prequels because he listens to the force more than anyone right that's his whole thing and now you can see totally why he does that because avar listens for the song um, Elzar man listens and finds the sea bell listens for the fire. Like, yeah, they, they, they each have their different way. They, they commune with the force, but they all do. And that's base level. Whereas mm-hmm. I think in the prequels that makes Yoda exceptional. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like my favorite line in the, in the book, I'm just, uh, there's gonna be a ton of them. I'm sure that come up, but it was, uh, bell Zedifar danced with fire and Loden great storm danced with wind. Yeah, yes. I was like, number one, beautiful poetry, yeah. but two, it's like, but I, that tells you so much. Yeah, sure. Right off the bat, there seems to be like a philosophical difference between the Jedi of the High Republic and the Jedi of the prequels, right? Yeah. Like they're mm. they're yeah. all connected to the Force in a different way. There's there's none of this, the dark side clouds everything bullcrap. Like it's like yeah. they're just in tune with the freaking Force, and that's how it Dude, is. Du- yeah. John Dutch Vander just said that in the chat. There's no maybe there's no dark side to cloud it, so oh, they can nice. hear so it more did. clearly. The song rings go. out. There as you it go. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, they definitely oh, yeah. seem more calm, but they also seem more idealistic from the people watching them. I guess that's so true. It's mm-hmm. like they were being they were being uh, viewed as as gods, I guess, and they didn't yeah. want to be seen that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we interestingly, we have a little bit uh, of what Charles Soule had to say himself about the Jedi that he was writing because he did this Polygon interview. And he actually said, the first thing I would say is that the idea of Light of the Jedi and the High Republic, the way that the Jedi are depicted in the initiative is not to reinvent or change or challenge what we know about them. It's simply to deepen it and depict them in an era when things were different. The Jedi that we saw in the prequels, which is where we basically saw a robust Jedi order so far, was under under the specter of a pretty corrupt Senate and a manipulative Sith Lord who had been doing everything that he could behind the scenes to undermine the Jedi order for a very long time. We don't have that influence. And so we have a Jedi order that is able to explore its connection to the force in a very deep way for a long time, which is great. So he's saying a lot of what you guys are saying, maybe and what the chat is saying, maybe it's that fact that the dark side that we know from the Sith is missing. And so we're maybe seeing them through a different lens. It's the same basic idea, but kind of more focused. Yeah. yeah it, it's so much harder to work effectively when you're under the gun, right? Like the Jedi and the prequels are always like, well, the Senate hates us and that they're going to try to outmaneuver us. Whereas in this book, it's so refreshing to see chancellor. So be like, Oh, and then we'll call in the Jedi like that. Yeah. It's, it's assumed. And it's kind of, they all in they're they're going to work together. So we don't even have to argue about that. And it's like, oh my God, it's, it's kind of a commentary on workplace environments, honestly. Yeah. Like if you're just like, cool, we're all going to work together. We don't have to fight about that. Great, moving on. 
Yeah, they're, they're they're much less like uh, at the will of the Senate too. It feels like like there mm-hmm. there there wasn't there wasn't a ton of discussion really about politics. I don't think in this book in this in the High Republic yet. Like Mm-mm. because we're all we're in the outer rim the whole time for the most part. But mm-hmm. um, there was a little bit, and you could kind of sense it between the lines a little bit. That like they seem to do what they want, and the Senate and the Chancellor can't really tell them what to do. Like as long as yeah. they're as long as the mission is in is in line with the Jedi ideal, then it's fine, and, and they're going to participate, yeah, yeah. right? But there doesn't seem to be that 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 sort of political. Do we help them this time or not? Right? That seems to be less <clears> of right. a less of a thing, which I've always like, wondered about because the Republic is funding the Jedi Order and their massive temple, right? Like that's right. that's taxpayer money paying for that, right? So, <laughs> like, don't well, they have a what... don't they have a way to a you know how how con- how much control do they actually have? I've always wondered that. Yeah. Well, that's what was so cool, I think, and, and I'm sure you're going to get to this in a second, Charles, about about the characters is they were heroic like that. They they went to help because that's what Jedi do. You know, Bell and Lo. there wasn't a question about do we have to check in with Avar Chris before we go down to the planet and save these people? It's like, mm-hmm. no, we go where the darkness is and we are justice and we help. And yeah. that it's understood. And it's like, oh, you. I don't think I realized how different that is from the prequel era until you read this book and you're like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh no, that's not what they were doing. <laughs> you know? I feel like if this was an experiment, this group of Jedi would be the control group, right? Yeah. Yes. Group everything Love is that. being judged on the yep. prequel Jedi or the OT. Um, yeah. these, this group in the High Republic era is the control group that everything is is compared against. Yeah, it's your variable like older... Chancellor Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> like you had that older sibling in high school that was like on the basketball team and got straight A's. It's like, oh, you're Avar Chris's brother? Oh, she was great. <laughs> really good. <laughs> like, I get it. Mace oh Windu's like, God damn it. I knew it. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, you know, that said, I think we can look at this kind of from the other angle. For any of you, did it feel like the High Republic Jedi were too perfect? Or do you think that's kind of exactly what they were going for in the the kind of Knights of the Round Table stuff that you were mentioning earlier, Corey, they were, they were certainly trying to pull in some of those like Arthurian themes, integrity, loyalty, camaraderie, but was it, mm-hmm. were they too perfect or, or were right. you okay with how they were represented? You know, I, I actually thought about this a lot while I was listening to you because I kept expecting it to be cringy. Like uh, th- I think that's the good sure, word, a good yeah. word for it. I kept expecting uh-huh. it to be, we are the hero Jedi here to save the day, but that was not how it was <laughs> at all. Like at least to mm-hmm. me, it didn't really strike me as like that. And, I tell you something else I really appreciated about this was the like how it, how it would highlight a lot of their flaws and and they discussed it so openly and without like shame and stuff the way that the 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 prequel trilogy does like for example yeah. there is obviously a a romance type of relationship between Avar Chris and Elzar Man right like that is yeah. obviously a thing there was a whole scene about it where they were in that little park area on the mm-hmm. at the end of the book right and. Um, like they openly discuss that, you know, those feelings that that's of the past and, you know, we, we don't really do that anymore, but there is, they flirt with each other and everything just fine. So there's like, yeah. it's, it's not this, we have to hide and be ashamed and all this stuff. Like it was in the prequel trilogy. Right. Like, yeah, I, I feel like we, we've gotten to the point in a lot of kind of modern fiction where if you're not cynical, then you're cringy. Right. I, I, I like the way you put that Corey, that like it, it, it feels cringe sometimes because, the world is very easy nowadays to be cynical in. And I think that uh, all of them in the higher public were very clear from the beginning of this incentive that, or uh, that they were all optimistic. Like the, it's, the galaxy is at peace. The galaxy is okay. You know? And I think that seeing heroes that are just being good people and being heroic was kind of a, a weird shock to the system in an age when we get a lot of cynical star Wars books about, you know, the empire and the first order and like life is hard. But just seeing good people do their best to try to be good people, yeah. I, I agree. I don't think it was cringy. I think it was admirable, and I think that it was really great to see heroes like that, um, be, yeah. being Jedi. You know, Trevor in the chat put it really well. He says there's a lot of self evaluation from various characters' point of view. That's Ooh, a good, yeah, totally. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Yep, like I that, think- and I. <laughs> so I'm reading about the ships now in the chat with Elzar and Avar. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait for more of that. And and we'll talk about their relationship in a little bit, but it interests me that you guys brought up that this 
it, it wasn't cringy necessarily just because there was clear delineation of good and evil. Because, I mean, if you think back to A New Hope, the fount from which all Star Wars springs, right? It, it <laughs> very much was good and evil, like yeah. light and dark. Like yeah. the, it, it could have been cringy. I, I don't think it was, but this kind of does really drive back to to the original trilogy and specifically the original film. I think in that way. Yeah, totally. So you know, regardless of your feelings on the Jedi themselves and their ideals, their power in this story is absolutely <laughs> undeniable. So let's talk a little bit about the force abilities that we saw that were new or or just kind of impressive in this story. I'm gonna yes, name please. kind of a list of them yeah. here and then y'all uh-huh. jump in and, and pick whichever ones you want. So Avar Chris uses battle meditation, not called yep. battle meditation, but it totally was. Uh, Porter Angle uses saber throws. He blocks blaster bolts with his bare hands. He contemplates freezing a blaster bolt in midair, just like Kylo Ren in The Force Awakens. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Charles. I mean to cut you off. Yeah, but you mean you ahead. mean the blade of Bardata? I do. <laughs> Angle, right? I should have used the full it's name. Legit. Definitely should have used the full name. I, yes. I gotta say, I I read the book and I liked him. Listen to the audio book. You will build a shrine to this man. Yeah. <laughs> Porter Angle is a king. There's this deep, <laughs> scary voice. Like, Mark Thompson was on a new level playing this one. It was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, Bill. And, like, and the way Bell talks about seeing him and, and like feeling the power inside him being like, oh, my God, if this guy cracks, he will kill everything he wants to. And he's like, <laughs> all right, everyone. I will, like, ugh. Sorry. Yeah. Porter Angle. No, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, he and Lode and Great Storm both demonstrated at least very redim- uh, rudimentary rather force healing powers with Eric. Oh, yeah, sure. That's right. True. Uh, Lode and Great Storm snapped his uses- leg in half. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yep. Lode and Great Storm uses the force to block out pain from his broken leg. Um, just like Anakin with his broken femurs in the expanded edition of the <laughs> Phantom Menace novelization. <laughs> Um, multiple, <laughs> multiple there's your first easter egg of the yeah. um, oh my god right multiple jedi uh, use what's called the jedi mind touch but that's hmm. the jedi mind trick depending on who you ask so that was interesting the, the jedi in this um, era are, are better than the than, than, than the prequel jedi. So. they don't do any tricks it's a, it's a gentle touch right it's a <laughs> nudge it's just a just, nudge just jedi a nudge. mind nudge <laughs> All right, last yeah. couple. Indira flies a starship using the force while she is actively physically flying another ship at the same time. Yeah. And probably my favorite one, Avar Chris and Elzar Man make it rain. Oh my okay? god. Okay. Cue the fat Joe soundtrack. Those of you that <laughs> are familiar with what I'm talking about. Guys, what was your favorite force power? What did you think overall about the, the power that was depicted by the Jedi in this story? I was a uh, I was a big fan of the battle meditation. Like you guys know how yeah. much of a Kotor nut I am, and the way that uh, it always weirded me out how battle meditation worked, like in in Kotor, because they talked about Bastila, like she just made battle better. Like it wasn't really highlighted, like how exactly it happened. <laughs> yeah. Just like you know, she 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 sits on the on the floor with her legs crossed, and and battle is is good, <laughs> right? Like. What the hell does right. that mean? But this this Avar Chris's battle meditation, like it described like her ability to communicate with other other Jedi and other Jedi would respond to her like with this like telekinetic thing, telepathic thing. Like it was awesome. I absolutely loved it. Like in that those yeah. early scenes, it was really fantastic. I think that's really what it comes down to is the way Soul described it all. Like even if it wasn't all new, the descriptions definitely were. And it was it, and I think it, he really led us down the garden path of realizing the force has always been described to us as the ultimate power in the universe, right? It is the universal power. Yeah. So of course it can do all these things. So once you get out of the way, get out of the reeds, like when all of the Jedi across the Hetzel system all focused to stop that one thing from, from flying into the sun, like that was absolutely insane power. But the way it was described, that was probably my, honestly my favorite power bit was all of them across you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of yeah. kilometers oh, yeah. focusing a on a point. single object because they could link up together because that's how strong the bond of the Jedi used to be. That's right. Um, 
was really powerful for me. I, although my favorites were probably some of the tech stuff that we'll get into later. Yeah, and Charles, you, you didn't even. You, I think you missed that one. Like where they? Yeah, I didn't where, even where, mention it. I forget the. You, you know the you know the one where where all the Jedi like use the Force <laughs> so hard from across the galaxy to move a giant <laughs> object from smashing into a planet that like you know a couple of Jedi died doing it. No big deal, right? <laughs> Inconsequential, really. Uh, they literally, like, and, and also, like, the fact that they were like, she's like, my Jedi, do this. And they're like, yeah. And some of them died. And they're like, that's awful. But, like, it, it, there wasn't a second thought. Right. Because right. they could save you. right over there. Like, <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. stuff. I think, I'm, I'm glad that we got a science lesson out of this, too, with Avar, Chris, and Elzar, man, teaching us how they made it rain. They didn't yes. just yeah. make it rain, right? They lifted the hot air from around those droids <laughs> up a little bit higher than like regular climate change would do for you. Yeah. And, and, and the condensation and the cloud forms in the, in the sky. Charles Soli absolutely <laughs> had to look up some basic meteorology to do that. Like, absolutely. Yeah, rain cycle. That's, dude, that is also 100% why I think Elzar Man is going to be like the writer's best friend going forward. Because... He is now the character like, hey, any crazy force thing you've ever wanted to do, Alzar will do it. Yeah. Sure. Like, he'll try it. What, he never uses the force the same way twice. Right? That's the quote. I'm like, what a quote to set up this character. Yeah. Absolutely. Lots of fun. Definitely. So it, it wasn't just the force that we learned about that was pretty unique in this story with the Jedi. It was also lightsabers and there are a couple of really great uh, great quotes here one of them is from page 79 it says the weapons sounded like nothing else in the galaxy to bell it was the sound of skill and training and focus in the choice of last resort and the art of the jedi lightsabers were designed to end conflicts they were designed to injure no more than necessary and in the horrible circumstance where death was the only possible outcome they would kill quickly no more damage would be done by a lightsaber than its wielder chose. There was no collateral damage with the lightsaber. I'm sorry, that doesn't sound like the same weapon that Anakin Skywalker was wielding. Um, if you use it like that, what does this say about the Jedi and their view on conflict as opposed to what we see later on? And do you think this viewpoint is carried forward by anyone or is it entirely lost? It's an interesting, interesting idea. It feels a little naive to me, honestly. Like the, the way that they the way that they talked about death a little bit in this book, it did take me back a little bit of being this sort of I'm I'm on this pedestal type of level of my own morality and ethics, right? Uh -huh, like uh -huh. that that like the Jedi can do no wrong. Like, wasn't it described at one point that uh I forget who it was, maybe it was the the head of the Jedi Council, but somebody was describing uh I think it was the head of the Jedi Council. Who was that, by the way? I have the. What I've, was that? I, I've was not the, memorized the name? council yet. There, there are so many. There are so many characters introducing this. Anyway, uh, yeah. she described that like what the Jedi do do is the will of the Force. It's not. Are you talking, about, not, Jor, you're talking about Jorah Mali? Okay, yeah, maybe that's, maybe yeah. that's who it was. Um, but she, she's describing like. Like the Jedi can't really do any wrong. Like it's not yeah. we shouldn't sit around and listen to what the will of the force is because the Jedi are the light, right? We we are what the right decision is. And I'm like, that yeah, is pretty arrogant. Yeah. <laughs> you're actually you're you're perfect on point. I have the exact quote right here. Oh, and perfect. I can read it for you. Page two ninety nine, and it was Jorah Mali. And it says, For her it was very simple. The Jedi were deeply connected to the light side of the force. Whatever choice any Jedi made was therefore the will of the force. Study and focus allowed the Jedi to become better instruments of that will, certainly, in much the way that a well-maintained lightsaber functioned better than one that had fallen into disrepair. But getting caught up in an endless debate about what the Force might want was paralyzing and a waste of time. Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah. So, like, I hope, you know, I said this early on, like, when they announced the High Republic stuff, I hope that we see the transition in, in philosophy and ideology in, in this series. Like, that mm -hmm. we see, like, there is the pieces of it are here. We have these hero-like Jedi that are obviously very true to what the Jedi are supposed to be, but there are pieces of like practical action, which I think was mm -hmm. essentially the bane of of what happened to the prequel Jedi, right? Yeah. Like they got too tied yeah. up in politics and helping people, and yep. it, it got all screwed up. So, yeah, yeah, and I, and I think to take that and go back to um, just a little bit about the lightsabers themselves, I think it's interesting if you compare how the lightsabers are used here with the way that lightsabers are used in like the Clone Wars TV show especially, but also the prequels. When you think of people like Yoda, who lived through this era, he does a lot 
fewer movements with his own saber. Like when he's fighting Dooku, that's something different, right? But as far as whenever he's in battle, it's very few moves. It's deflecting a few things here. Like in the first, in the pilot of Clone Wars, he deflects blasters and like hits the trees and they fall into Black Pass. Like it's, it's not a lot of ex excess strikes and not a lot of excess destruction. And I think that's where this is coming from versus some of the younger Jedi, but the more intense prequel Jedi are all about like, I'm gonna slash through this, 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 this. And it looks cool. Don't get me wrong, it's very fun. But I feel like these Jedi were a lot more like classically, classic samurai in their ways. Like when Bell and Loden go to that compound, they talk, talk as much as they can. And they only even activate the lightsaber when there's blasters being fired upon them. Like it, it is a last resort because I think the Jedi of this era understand how much the force can do. And I think frankly, now the prequel Jedi, I think they underestimate how much they could actually do with the force yeah. If, again, a Sith Lord wasn't clouding it, wasn't cutting them off, so they probably have to use their lightsabers more often because they can't hear as well, frankly. Mm. Good point. Good point. Let's, I like we, this era a lot. Can, it's very yeah, fun. It's, it's so much fun. <laughs> it's so much fun. Can we? I'm sure you're probably going to bring this up later, Charles, but Cheryl brought it up in the chat. This might be a good time to bring it up. Like The fact that they used their lightsabers and their weapon systems in <gasps> their ship was... Can we talk about vectors? The Can we talk most about vectors, clever... Oh, my God. <laughs> Charles Soul, you, if you didn't come up with this idea, whoever did is an absolute freaking genius. This is oh. the coolest idea I've ever heard. Like at, at, As soon as they as soon as they named it in the book, I was like, okay, so they plugged their lightsabers into the ship. That's a little cheesy, perhaps. But then they went into this whole thing about how, like, it solidifies that if you pull the trigger, you have to have the intent to kill. Like, it had this very, like, philosophical tie-in. I'm like, dude, that is so good. Like, the weapon of yep. the Jedi is also the weapon of their ships. That is incredible. That was such an and, incredible and which, detail. Which also leads, and, and I, I know I've, we're jumping ahead, but th this, I, I can't hold it anymore. Spice didn't mention it in the chat. The coolest moment of maybe my Star Wars life was in this book when Loden Great Storm rips off a vector-mounted gun, <laughs> and then whilst riding a space horse, <laughs> shoulder mounts it, slaps his lightsaber into it and blasts a cannon as they're just storming down the planes. Like, it, that is the most cinematic Star Wars moment. And again, like you're saying, Corey, it's, it's mixed up in the meditation. Like, the weapon is your is the Jedi's life of, of acknowledging its use and also knowing far ahead that I need to rip off this piece of machinery so I can <laughs> shoulder mount it. Like, it was... Oh, my God. I, uh, if you don't love... If, if Star Wars ain't freaking cool as hell, guys, reading is fun. It what is did that, rad, kid. What that did that amazing. sound like in the audiobook? Did it have did it have the sound oh, yeah. effect of it of yeah. the missile going off or the laser going I can't off? I remember. Did there were yeah, like a, listen, I, I, was a I think deep. we need to I think we need to pause and talk about the the audiobook production here in a second. Like let's let's come back yeah. to that after we finish this talk about the vectors and the lightsaber, I think. Yeah. Um yeah, that was it was so epic. Like the vectors, the way it described their ships of being like the Jedi, it was incredible. Like mm -hmm. the fact that they used yeah. their lightsaber in it was an absolute genius. Yeah. Genius. And then only Jedi can fly them. I, I like that that little trick as well. Cause like obviously like the Octus uh two and, and stuff like that 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 they fly in the the prequels is very cool and they have Jedi Starfighters and things like that. But to make it like, no, these ships were so hard to fly that if you weren't a Jedi, you couldn't do it. Yeah. I think it's a really fun way. Also, their designs are beautiful. If you haven't looked them up online, check out a vector. They look amazing. And a lot of them are like recycled designs from earlier prequel things, which I think is also super cool. I love that they use recycled designs for this whole era. Um, but yeah, I, I need more of these in more visual mediums because, um, gosh, they're freaking amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you guys have already talked a lot about kind of what my next thought was that I wanted to get into. And it's really the, the Jedi's view on the force itself. And so one quote that y'all have already brought up, Eric, you brought this up on page 106 was, uh, it's talking about Avar Chris, what she heard as a song, Elzar Man saw as a deep, endless storm tossed sea. The Wookiee Buriaga was a single leaf on a gigantic tree with deep dug roots and sky high limbs. Douglas Sunvale saw the force as a huge interlocked set of gears made of an endless variety of materials from crystal to bone. Bell Zetafar danced with fire, Loden Great Store danced with wind. This was not the simple network she had built earlier. This was deeper. 
all of the Jedi were the force and the force was all of them. And she, Avar Chris could touch them all, no matter how they saw the force. <laughs> so this quote, it strikes me that in this era, there's no right quote unquote, right way to be a Jedi. We know Elzar man's job, what he wanted to do within the Jedi was to be the guy that figured out new ways to be a Jedi, new ways to use the force. Right. This is all very different than the prequels. Did this book introduce you to the idea that there's not a right and wrong way to be a Jedi? Oh, yeah. And I, I just want to say real quick before we get to that part, that passage you just spoke, to me, that's the pitch for this book. Yeah, it is. I think if you're if, if, if Charles Soule was going in with the idea, I think that would honestly be the, the, the passage that I would pitch to Lucasfilm to say, this is the High Republic. I like I think that that is it as a whole. These are what the Jedi are. This is how it's different. And I think that is the best pitch. If you if you have a friend and you're listening to the show who hasn't read this book or is a little hesitant, I would encourage you to show them that. I think that's a great way to show how different it is. And to your point, Charles, I think this book absolutely made me realize how different Jedi could be because in when we've seen masses of Jedi in the Clone Wars, the prequel era, I think we've all said, "Oh, well they're they're not as wise as Yoda. They're not as powerful as Mace, but they're good at, at X. And it's kind of on a spectrum of good to great. Whereas I think all these Jedi, like I have my favorites, we all have our favorites, but they seem a little more on an even level because they're all good at different things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would, we, we rate our, we rate our books on, on five sort of key areas. When we review books at, at UT needs very objective side of a way of looking at it. And one of the ways that we look at books is originality specifically. And mm -hmm. I, I think that is, is very hard to argue that this is not a perfect 10 in originality as far as Charles Soule's creativity here, because yeah, the way Absolutely. he describes the force in like 20 different ways in this book. So like, it's so yeah. next level and deep, like it's very visual. Like I've really never seen I've never seen anything like this before as far as like this descriptions of the force. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's super nuts. Yeah. Well, we should probably move from talking about the Jedi as a whole and talk about some individuals, or this is going to end up being a five parter. So <laughs> let's, let's do it. <laughs> talk about Avar Chris. I think it's a good place to start. And Avar has really become the face of the Jedi, I think, in the High Republic era, both in the story when she's instrumental in the Jedi's fight against the Nile, but also in real life, being the center of the cover of this book and also appearing in other mediums like comics. So what is it about Avar Chris that makes her such a good representation of this era? I, I'll, I'll start this first, and then Wes and Corey, I want to hear you guys, because we, we, we should each kind of like dive in a lot on these main characters. A Avar Chris being the face of the Jedi, if you will, for this era, I think is important for a couple of reasons. I mean, no, number one, I, I don't think we can at all ignore the fact that this is a woman leading the Jedi. I think this is, we have not seen That's a good point. many main female Jedi, and she is like the epitome of, of, of that. And in 2021, that is still a big deal. Um, so I think that is, and Chancellor So is also a woman. They talked about on the Disney Plus thing, like they wanted a woman leading this era, and that was, you know, they just knew that from the start. But I also think for Avar Chris's character as a whole, she is just a good Jedi that listens to the Force, and all her greatest power is focused on listening to her fellow Jedi and figuring out where they are, to listening to conflict and figure out what is needed. Like, she really feels like a general in every sense of the way. You know what I mean? Yeah, like she does. I, yeah, so that, that's what I got from her is that she is – maybe the most big picture Jedi we've seen. Like Yoda feels lost um, yeah. and things like that, but he's never quite keyed into every individual thing. Whereas I think Avar Chris is really meant to see the force and as the web it is. And I like yeah. that we first saw her in the Charles Soule Star Wars comic where they found the holocron way back when, because I think she's a good voice to link the eras. What do you guys think? Yeah. I mean, I can totally get behind that. Like, like, I mean, I'll say again, the way that, that soul describes the force and all these characters is really incredible. And I'm really glad to see a, a woman at the charge of the uh, head of the council too. Like it's kind of very similar to uh, uh, what was her Satali Sean? Is that her name in the old Republic? That's like, that's a stretch legends right there. That's uh, it's the, 
I know it's the it's the head of the head Corey. of the Jedi Order in the Star Wars: The Old Republic MMO game. I think it's Satali Sean. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah there's yeah, the chat. Yeah, yeah. Falcon three six. Yeah, there Satil, it is. Satil, Satali, Satil. Oh, Satil. That's how you say it. Satil Sean. Yeah, it's Bastille's like granddaughter, great granddaughter, yeah. some crap. I don't know. Anyway, she's she's head of the <laughs> she's head of the council, um, and she's an epic character, and I'm really pleased to see that. Like, there's a lot more diversity in the in the oh yeah the High Republic, which is awesome. Like the sure. more the yeah. more cool looking Jedi we get, the better. I want yeah. I want all the different skin colors and languages and aliens. I want all of it. Bring me all Absolutely. of that stuff because it's so it's so much fun to see the to see how varied the Jedi are. There's a freaking Trandoshan Jedi for crying out loud. That is <laughs> amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yes, fantastic. Yeah. Also, I have to. I can I would be. I would be a moron if I did not bring up in the chat earlier that J.C. Carson said that that Corey. What did he say? He said Corey would see the Force as an endless stream of. Sl- Slack messages. <laughs> if that is exactly. not accurate, I don't know what it is. You close your eyes and you just hear those little like clicks over and over. And over. That's right. I'm <laughs> like, oh man, it's meditation. I just sit and I listen. Hear them. To... I hear them. It's excellent. <laughs> Avar, I think Avar is the epitome of the. I get, what is it? The sum of all parts is uh, not as great as the whole. So she, mm-hmm. because she puts she's able to connect everybody together like that i think yeah she should be or is the 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 head of of all the jedi that are looking to i guess looking to to follow in her footsteps kind of like they how they do with yoda and uh the prequel and the um original trilogy yeah i think i mean west when you say it like that honestly it hits me that like she's just a good role model and it yeah. might be that simple cuz i think yes. a lot of the jedi we like the flaws of the Jedi. It makes for good storytelling, but it's also kind of just nice to have a good role model. There you, you go. Know? I mean, it's that simple. So yeah, Avar Chris would love. To, I would. I hope when I grow up, I get to be like Avar Chris. But this whole thing isn't over yet, so don't meet your heroes, right? Yes, that's very true. <laughs> uh, three years from now, don't click this and be like, oh, so when she killed all the Jedi. That was that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, so she does have some questionable tendencies, I think, in, in this book. She has a really interesting relationship with another Jedi, Elzar Mann. No relation to George Mann, <laughs> as far as we know. Um, but, <laughs> but you know what, though? There's I've two I've not ends. even started that. There's there are two ends. Two ends. Not Jedi even occurred to me. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's um, great. We we don't know how that's going to pan out yet, but we do know that there's clearly a romantic history there, and that was illustrated by the epilogue in particular. And it was on page 375 we saw this quote, Elzar suspected they were both thinking about the same thing, shared moments as Padawans, tolerated and understood and even common, but things to be left behind once one ascended to become an adult in the order. They hadn't discussed those moments, not in a very long time and never with more than an oblique reference, but they were never very far away from each other's minds, especially when they were together. So here we see a Jedi, two Jedi, in fact, who clearly seem to be showing attachment, uh, Mm -hmm. maybe even love. Do you think that we're going to see that relationship come to fruition and if we do see that does it take away from the reputation of the jedi if you see them struggling with the same issues that we see in the prequels oh Oh, we gotta see it we got i think there's they're definitely seeing that in which also by the way speaking of the audiobook that we did if you want to listen to elzar man's voice mark thompson makes him the coolest guy Oh, you have God. ever he's just exudes coolness. Yes. I love his Elzar. But yeah, I think they got to explore that relationship. Um I don't think it makes them weaker or anything like that. I think that it's it's going to be a, again a unique look at relationships in, within the Jedi and maybe what happens with Elzar and Avar is a reason that later on they say no to that. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah. I mm-hmm. think it's I think it's a, I would love to see it be done well. Um like his I don't know what what a healthy relationships in love looks like in the Jedi Order, right? Like in Luke's Jedi Listen, Order in I Legends. I want them to kiss. I want them to kiss. <laughs> in Luke's Avar Jedi kiss. Order. Avar kiss. That's what I want to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and legends, they could do whatever they wanted, right? They could marry and whatever, right? So yeah. Luke didn't forbid that at all. So yeah. I mean, well, I hey, don't know. Rail Avaros, come on! <laughs> yeah. I, I got my rail voice. Rail Avaros. 
<laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, so I mean, I would I would love to see it be done well and uh, like yeah. maybe less condemned. I don't know. I would love to see it done well. Like the the way that yeah. Anakin described. You remember how Anakin described? I oh, don't know. I'm on a ramble here. Remember how Anakin described uh, uh, what the Jedi are allowed to do to Padme on the transporter uh, on the transport yeah, yeah, vessel yeah. on the way to Compassion. Naboo? Yeah, he's yeah. like. He said, "Compassion is encouraged, and you know, unconditional, unconditional love. love. Yes, yeah, right, right. It was cool. Attachment forbidden, right? Yeah, that was a great story. In that, it's like, what the hell does that actually mean, right? Because yeah. it sounds like the Jedi are just not allowed to get laid, right? <laughs> <laughs> which, which clearly, not all the way true. But I also think there's an idea where the attachment, I, I would assume." is more so like if you're attached to someone, then you can't be attached to the force and everything else. And who is more attached to the force than Avar Chris, right? Yeah. So I think as long as you can keep open to the universe, maybe then that doesn't contradict it. I think that, again, I think we got a couple of years of this initiative. I think we're definitely going to see more expansion on that. The most yeah. they're going to do is hold hands and exchange Valentines. That's it. <laughs> That's all they're going to do. Uh, Don't get your hopes Wait, up. wait. Wes, handmade Valentines or like store-bought? Is this like, is this like a mass Jedi no, Valentine's the, party? These are, these are the candy hearts that have those horrible phrases on them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all they're going to get. <laughs> oh, my God. Amazing. Well, from Soul's same Polygon interview that I brought up earlier, he talked a little bit about this, and he said, the thing to know about the High Republic's Jedi is that the rules that exist in the prequel trilogy still exist. They still take the same vows. They still have the same feelings about it. But their understanding of the strength of the Order and flexibility within the Order and the interpretation of those rules, they're more diffuse. The way the Jedi is out uh, at outposts in the Outer Rim might look at the rules of the Order might be a little different than the way that they're interpreted in the prequels or on Coruscant. Love, in some ways, is also about letting go. It's about letting people be who they are and supporting them through that journey, which is the opposite of attachment. And so I think it's very easy for a Jedi to love. It's just you have to love without being controlling and love without being afraid of losing somebody. And that sounds like Anakin. That sounds like what you were saying, Corey. In yeah. some ways, you might say Jedi are encouraged to love. That's right. That's, yeah. that's, right. that's right, man. Our, our chat's getting real <laughs> thirsty love, right now. I love love our chat's working. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think I think Grab this some does. Water, y'all. I know. Woo! It's getting toasty. Yeah. No, I think uh, I think uh, I think it does really open the door to some really interesting uh, interesting conversation regarding love and attachment from the perspective of a Jedi, perhaps in a way that we've never yeah. seen done before. Like, I hope we, I hope we get, we get some more middle ground of, of it's either yeah. no boyfriends, no girlfriends, like somebody said in the chat or like, like to what Luke is like, Oh, whatever. You can be married or polygamist or whatever. I don't know where we draw the line, whatever. It's cool. You know, yeah. I will bet you dollars to donuts that there's a, at least a book or a comic where Elzar and Ava are on a mission and, Oh no, our vectors crashed. Oh, it'll be three weeks before they get to find us. Oh, we'll have to survive somehow. Oh, there's one blanket in this cave. Oh no! Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's already that's already been written and put on the internet somewhere. That's right. Yeah. That's up. And what I mean is basically that Star Wars Rebels episode with a Zeb and Callus, but it's Alfar yes. and Avar. <laughs> One oh. heating module, only one <laughs> heating module. And they were roommates. <laughs> should we should we maybe then talk about who would undoubtedly be the best lover of all the High Republic Jedi <laughs> loading great storm? <laughs> we, sh we should, Charles. What do you want to talk about? Our so, I, can, guys, have can I ever we talk called about... my shot better than my I changed my name to Great Storm in Discord six months ago. Yes, and then yeah, I read yeah. this book. The validation. Yes. I just want to talk. Oh. About, I just want to talk about his serpentine writhings. All right, we, we didn't see that <laughs> no, anywhere just... in this book. <laughs> <laughs> That's an I Jedi. I don't have that quote handy, uh, but <laughs> Loden Great Storm to refresh y'all's memories. He's the Twi'lek -like Jedi. He's appointed to the Jedi outpost on Alfrona. He has his Padawan Belzedifar, and he's known to be very powerful like amongst the greatest that the current order has to offer. And he's pretty consistently a badass in this novel from yeah. apprehending the marauders that are attacking the compound on Elfrona to facing down the Nile with the help of a lightsaber gun, as Eric mentioned earlier. <laughs> So good. And then he essentially sacrifices himself, despite the fact that he's a great Jedi, to save one citizen of the Republic uh, with Otto Blythe. What were your overall impressions on Loden? He's like if Mace Windu didn't suck. 
<laughs> you know? He's like, he's powerful. That's a clip. That's a clip right there. So at least somebody <laughs> clipped that. He's like, if Mace Windu didn't suck, I can tell you for damn sure that Loden Gregstorm would never look at anybody and be like, mind your business, citizen. Like, yeah, no, that would not happen. He's so great. And, and I think the cool thing about Bell. Or sorry, Loden and Bell. Honestly, I love their master apprentice relationship. I I really loved all their stuff. I think Loden is a great teacher. I also think he's a great warrior, and I also think he's a great wise Jedi. You know, I think yeah. that the sacrifice. Honestly, it hit me very hard at the end. Um, the 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 prison in which he is put is is brilliant, frankly designed, which I know we'll talk about in a later episode mm -hmm. uh, for Markion. But like, Gian. all all the stuff that 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 he does, I think is best summed up by a quote that you honestly might have is Bell's way of describing him that when Bell listens for the fire within himself, he, oh, yeah. he senses Loden mm. as an inferno hidden behind a wall that at any point he could let it out, but he doesn't. And I think that's true power mm. is knowing you could at any point do anything you need, but only doing what the force requires. Yeah. Uh, Loden is, is far and away one of my favorite Jedi now. Um, Bar none, I can't wait to see where his, frankly, very intense story goes after this book. Did you guys love Loden as much as Eric? <laughs> I mean, he was kind of whatever. That's, I mean, right. <laughs> <laughs> I loved him. I mean, he was just like, like he, he strikes me as that type of character. He's a big guy. He's like always laughing, like at the heat of battle, how epic it is because it's great fun. And he was just a wonderful character. Absolutely wonderful character. So much. Yeah. You, you totally hit, hit the nail on the head earlier, Eric, about getting his username <laughs> like the the <laughs> scene i think the scene in which we really figured out that he was so incredible was when he uh like when they first landed right when he confronted the the captain of the little compound or whatever yep, and the security yeah. or whatever, he's like yeah. he was like you're gonna open this door and the guy's like okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, that was the end of that <laughs> yeah and then all the all, whenever they got a fight right he says bell what does the force ask us to do today? You know, it was it's very much like yes. yeah. having fun with it. I like, we're going to win. I like how he was, I mean, his main goal in, in obviously in, in stopping some of the, the emergencies from coming out or whatever, but it was teaching his yes, Padawan. Still and teaching. He, yes. he was, he was teaching it like throughout the entire process, whether they, whether they were at the council or they were, um, they were on the ships or they were helping out somewhere. He was always teaching, and I thought yeah. that was really cool. So that, 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 like you said, Eric, in the so Master much. Apprentice era. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I gotta I'm say, really also, glad there's... you brought that up. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Eric. I would say one last thing about their relationship because I know we're gonna talk about Bell as well. Um, Bell is 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 an amazing, amazing character. Joxy brings up he's the best, or no, sorry, James does brings it up. He's the best because he has a dog, which is <laughs> absolutely true. He does, but like, there is something. So like again, we we don't have a lot of black Jedi, and the fact that like this teacher is putting all his all his faith, pure none, into this young black man to be like, no, you're a great Jedi. I love yeah. and believe in you. Like yeah, that's yeah. that's that is a big deal in Star Wars still, and like to have the most powerful man in the world also have that level of teaching and respect for his Padawan is uh, is really great because I think we also see a lot of contentious Master and Apprentice stuff. And to see just mm. unhindered, like I would, I would read a, a seventy-five issue comic book series about them going off on missions. Like yeah. I want to see Bell and Loden mm -hmm. ad nauseum. Yeah, Love that. Good yeah, they, they they might be they might be the best Jedi Padawan pairing we've ever seen ever in the yeah. history of Star Wars. Like seriously, oh. like yeah, he he is such a like we think about it all the all the Jedi Master relationships. The Padawan master relationships we see in Star Wars have flaws. Every single one that I can think of, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I can I know see the someone who in his voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, his head is so huge. Uh, <laughs> listen, Obi Wan and Anakin had a lot of issues, man, and and Obi Wan yeah. and and Qui Gon had a lot of issues. Uh, and I will never forget the I can't remember their their names. Uh, who is the um, Luminara and uh, who's the the Oh, Barris Offy. Yeah, so Barris Offy. Terrorist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, 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 <laughs> that episode of Clone Wars where it really highlights how kind of screwed up their relationship is. Like it, Star Wars has constantly highlighted how bad relationships look between Padawans and hmm. even even Dooku and Yoda, like in the Dooku yep. Jedi Lost. Like 
but their relationship is flawless. It's so good. Like he really looks up to uh, re Bell. Really looks up to Loden, and Loden knows yeah. when to push him. Like when he, when he, when he, like Literally, when he transition. Yes, he would push him off, and push him <laughs> off a cliff. But, but also, when it was time for Bell to step up to the plate and jump out of the ship, he gave him like the the pep talk at just the right moment, and yep. he fully trusted in him. It was is beautiful teaching. Well, like yeah, he's a great well, teacher. Yeah, Let's talk those, about that because so much of their relationship is from that specific yeah. teaching yeah. moment. And I, and I do have a quote here I want to read for y'all because I think it's important and it drives home exactly what you're saying. This is from page 36. And it says, Loden Greatstorm's philosophy as a teacher was very simple. If Bell was theoretically capable of something, even if Loden could do it 10 times as fast and 100 times more skillfully, then Bell would end up doing that thing, not Loden. If I do everything, no one will ever learn anything, his master was fond of saying. And so a lot of that came that's teaching. into that's the picture. That's teaching. It is. It <laughs> that's is. all it is. Exactly. So exactly. And a lot of Bell's story really did revolve around his struggle to accomplish exactly what you're talking about, using the force to basically cushion his fall uh, from great heights, essentially. And, yeah. you know, he regularly fails at that throughout the book, whether it was jumping yeah. out of his vector to being, you know, forced off the cliff, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then he does end up succeeding in a spectacular way at the end of the novel. He throws himself from his vector on purpose from probably the highest height we've seen yet and ends yep. up saving B. Blythe, one of the, the young settlers that was on Elfrona. So what, what were your thoughts on him accomplishing that? And what does it say about his relationship with Loden and about Loden himself and, and about Zell? Because obviously yeah. he found that power within himself. I, I felt so proud, honestly. Like just, I was, it's kind of like I, we followed this guy learning and then he, he gets it and you, you just, you feel proud because of the way that Loden's inner monologue has talked about him throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Like, because Loden wasn't there to witness that. So I felt like as audience, we had to then be proud of him and say, like, we know Loden's not here, but we see you. We see your accomplishment. And like when he has that 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 conversation and says, Hey man, like I uh I think you're a Jedi Knight now. Like that's that's amazing. That was incredible. That yeah, was Wes, great. what do you think about that, dude? That was that was that like was getting your black belt or something. Um yeah. but uh I mean, so uh, Bell, he he does not succeed when he jumps out of the vector, right? Uh, in the in the beginning, and then he does not succeed when he falls from the plateau when they're on uh, was L four was up there with the right Frona, yeah, yeah, Frona. Um, and then he succeeds in great success. Succeeds in success. Yes, <laughs> he absolutely. Succeeds. Ten out of ten. Without, I mean, just floating down like a leaf is what the is what Charles had put in. Charles Soule had yeah, said, yeah. and then. I was like, I mean, come on. He, he didn't skin his knees when he was carrying this yeah. person. He, he had an extra person. I mean, he would at least fall over, right? But yeah. he made a perfect landing. I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah. And I also love that, like, my one of my, my my emotional moment in this book, honestly, at the end, when Loden gets taken, the fact that Bell's like, no, I'm not, I'm, I will not be a Jedi Knight unless he's there to see me. It's yeah. very much like, I need my dad at graduation. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. And that, that, wow. that, hit, that hit me, man. <laughs> Father son stuff really yeah. hits me and you don't get a lot of that in star Wars. Cause they all die. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but this is as close as we get, you know, he's like, I'm going to save him. And then you tell me I'm a Jedi Knight. Cause yeah. I respect you. And I love you, dad. Wow. <laughs> love you, dad. Do you want to have a catch? <laughs> <laughs> Poor catch? Oh my God. I just, I just, I just watched, uh, I, I'm doing my Marvel rewatch right now. And I just, we just watched the second Guardians of the galaxy movie when they have this stupid, <laughs> Stupid catch game using that little yeah. ball of light thing. I think it was so dumb. Anyway, I, yep. I was I was gonna say like we were really harking on uh, on uh, uh, Great Storm earlier. Like I I do wonder if if the reason that Great Storm is such a great character is a, a lot to do with Bell and what kind of Padawan he mm. is. Because somebody brought up in the chat earlier. I think it was. Uh, let me make sure I give him credit. It was where did it go? It was pretty high up there. Uh, something 5H. Oh, Josh 5H. Imagine, Josh, yeah. he said, imagine if Loden trained with Anakin. And I'm like, hmm, that is an interesting thought experiment because would it be as good of a relationship if, because Anakin does not have the humility that Bell has, right? Like, 
Bell is yeah. is really mm. he's also a real true Jedi, right? Like he he understands yeah, yeah. the master padawan relationship. He feels like there's a lot to learn. He's incredibly humble. He's incredibly modest. Like I think that works with the master like Loden. So you know, we, I think we yeah. got to give Bell credit where credit is due. Is I think he makes Loden a better Jedi too. Yeah, it's like be Belichick cool and Brady. Duo. You know, like Brady leaves and then Belichick misses the playoffs, but Brady goes to the Super Bowl. So if <laughs> Bell leaves. Does Loden go to the city? You know, same thing. Same thing. <laughs> are you saying Charles before Eric went on uh, this highly uh, convoluted <laughs> sports reference? Sports. Uh, <laughs> no, I was, I was saying that Great Storm and Skywalker would be the coolest name duo in the history of oh, the order, for yes. sure. Sky Storm or Sky Storm Great Walker. Yeah. Great well, Walker. let's let's move on from this touching, you know, father son dynamic that we're talking about <laughs> to the nurturing family that is the Nile and Nile is actually Latin for nothing, right? (laughs) That, that means nothing as in nihilism, you know, the belief system in which you reject any and every moral principle as meaningless, but the Nile in this story, they're also the main antagonists and they're a group of essentially masked marauders and they operate in the outer rim, taking whatever they please. And their success is largely dependent on their alternative hyperspace routes called paths with a capital P. What were your overall thoughts on the Nile as villains? And importantly, did you appreciate having something other than a Sith as the foil to the Jedi? Or did you end up finding them somehow less impressive? I, I, I have to say, I said earlier, I wanted to bring up how incredible the audiobook experience was. Um, the first time we got to the Nihil uh in the audiobook mark thompson's performance in combination with the the sound effects that they put over their voices when they're in their mask is next level guys like you have to i i I, I forgot to do it for this episode remind me i'm gonna play we're gonna play a couple clips from the audiobook on the show because i think we i think we can do some really really short clips as to do commentary about and it's it's perfectly fine um but like Dude, like this audiobook was like a 12 out of 10. Like the yeah. it had an original score, like it was incredible. Like there were vocal sound effects. Mark Thompson himself voiced so many freaking characters that we've not heard him voice in other stuff. Like he's done a lot of Star Wars now, right? The general yeah. in the High Republic sounds very similar to the general in the Thrawn books. But that's mm-hmm. pretty much the only similarity between any other performance <laughs> Mark Thompson has had. Like his yeah. Martian performance was unbelievable. The, what they did with the with the vocals when they're in their mask was unbelievable. It was an incredible experience. The freaking wreck punk music that they played in the background <laughs> yeah. was, oh my God, it was so good. And I, I think one of the scenes, I, I want to share part of the scene with you guys, is I, I clipped it out and put it in our Slack because it hit me so freaking hard when all of those freaking Nihil, when, uh, 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 what's his name? Ka- Cass? Cass? What's this guy's name? Uh, Kasev. 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 Yeah. When Kasev does oh. the drugs, <laughs> that scene, <laughs> when the that drugs. scene, yes, there's the adrenal drugs. That's right. <laughs> when Kasev and his crew all do the smash together, that scene, Mark Thompson was on another plane. He was on another yeah. plane when he acted that scene because he was in no space. He was, dude. He was yes! like, like he, he like, he, he like snorts really loud. And then he's like, you feel it hits you. I'm just like, bro, like, calm down. You know what it, they this say. Is, it's an audio book. Like, when actors really get into their characters, they like, turn into the characters themselves. Dude, you know, it you, was, know, Eric, you know all about this. It was yeah, unbelievable. Exactly. That's how it works. Unbelievable. Gotta, like, it, was, it was single. Listen, uh, that two minutes of Mark Thompson doing that drug uh, scene is unquestionably the most epic audiobook experience of any Star Wars production. I would go as far as say any audiobook I've ever listened to, including the audio dramas that we got, which are on another level. Like yeah. this this was just such an incredible audiobook experience. Mark Thompson yeah. is a flipping genius. Like absolutely. Yeah. And like and the way they like also just organize, like aside from the characters themselves, the way they describe the organization of the Nihil made me respect them too, right? Because like doing the whole like all the storm imagery could be like kind of lame and stuff potentially but it was awesome like oh cool so i understand the factions and they're they're more like these like mad max fury road mixed with firefly reaver destructoid pirates um and i'll also <laughs> say maybe my hottest wow. take 
Me, yeah, there you go. That's why that I was saw a these great guys. description. <laughs> Did you come up with that on the fly? It was pretty impressive. I'm <laughs> clip Thank that. you for sure. Um, clipping that. My hot, my hottest take maybe might be that I think Markeon Rowe, if we're talking impact per page, might be the most impactful villain Star Wars has ever seen. As far as like, because if you're talking screen time, essentially things like that, he's not in. He's only in this book so far. And he's not in that much, especially until like the second half or maybe even the last third, right? But his final scenes, I am terrified of Markeon. <laughs> he's so scary, and he dude. Is, and he is, <laughs> and he's going to be here for a while, you know? And I, I, I seriously, I am, this, this villain introduction hit me harder than any new villain in Star Wars had in years, Bar none. I love this character. I also want him played by Andrew Scott, who is Moriarty <laughs> from Sherlock. So let's uh that's my thought on the Nile. Wes <laughs> Wes Nihil, what do you think? All right. I just wanna I wanna quote something from the Nile. Um, and it was right as Mark Rowe was really rising up to like the power that he he thought he should be. And it starts out. He punched Kasav right in his stupid, cunning, savage face. Markion's gloves were reinforced with armored plates and acceleration compensators. He could punch a hole in a durasteel wall and not feel a twinge of pain. He, he heard the sound as Kasav's stupid, cunning, savage nose crumpled under his fist, and by the path, it felt good. <laughs> Incredible. Real so quick, awesome. uh, shout out to James for saying Markeon Rowe wins the Dion Waiters Heat Check Award. Yes, that's a joke for me. Yes, I agree. And I also want to bring you guys to hope oh, because I love that. Is um <clears throat> oh did I oh hold on. Did I lose? Am I good? You're good. No, you're good. You're here. You're good. It, it it blipped for a minute. Can you still hear us? We're we're good. Oh, I don't think you can hear us. We okay. lost him. He's riding the stick. Anyway, sorry. I think I lost you. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Are you back? Are you back? <laughs> Eric, hello, hello, hello. Uh, nope. All right. Anyway. But acceleration <laughs> compensators on gloves so you can punch harder? Dude. I mean, he might be the best. He might be the best character in the damn book so yeah. far. <laughs> <laughs> he is, and the way that Mark Thompson did his voice was in incredible. And I don't even listen. I don't I, know. I, are you back now, Eric? Okay, sorry. Um, I don't yeah, know. What, I'm back. I'm back. Sorry, I don't, I, I don't know. What is he? What is he? What does he look like? What What is he? He's. They described him early on in the book as a certain kind of alien. Is he? What is he? He's gray. He looks he's like a gray shark. skinned. With black okay. eyes, right? Listen, yeah. I I don't know if this he's is going to be a reveal, man. Okay, I don't know if. I oh, pictured, blue. I pictured, blue, yeah. listen, I don't know. I don't know what you guys pictured. I pictured the Jedi hunter dude from the rise of Skywalker. Do you remember that guy? Oh, Ochi of Bastoon. Yes. Ochi. Ochi mm. Yes. That is who I pictured Ooh. in my mind the whole time. And it made for a really cool visual experience with his voice and, Man, the way that wow. the way that Mark Thompson, yeah. dude, you got to do it again, Eric. The whole okay, yeah. So I would say one of my one of my before my my earbuds went crazy. Uh, one of my quotes was, "Kasiv, don't forget your hand." Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, he cuts his freaking hand off, and he goes like, "Oh, did you drop that? I would hate not to be able to high five you." <laughs> Whatever he's like, imagine him going up like, "I'd like a number one with no." Pickles and Dr. Pepper. <laughs> like, I want Mark oh really to do everything forever. Uh, your ability to do that is unbelievable, Eric. <laughs> oh man. Yes. I, I don't I don't know I don't know where Mark Thompson found the voice to do this guy, but he's never done anything like this performance. Like and like like you said earlier, Eric, you guys got to go back and listen to, I think Mark Thompson was the first interview we ever did on Living Force, and it was still one of my favorite interviews, and mm -hmm. he talks all about finding a voice for a character, right? Because he does, he he picks the voice, essentially, right? Yeah. They, they it, told, it was he, perfect. It was oh my God. so perfect and scary and creepy. Like, I got, my skin mm -hmm. would crawl listening to his monologues yeah. and stuff, because I'm like... This guy is a cold-blooded killer. When he's talking about when he was talking when he's talking about the old lady in the uh, in the like the healing chamber oh, thing, yeah. I was like, this guy is flippant scary, man. Like yeah. he's controlling and the, the her, manipulating is her. Like, oh, sh like she's having a seizure. Is she gonna die this time? 
Huh. He's like, maybe. I could, like, Jesus. maybe I should, maybe I should just cut her throat and put her out of her misery. I'm just like, okay, bro. <laughs> like, this guy. Well, like, it, I can't, I can't oh. wait. I can't wait to hear his villain origin story because that is coming, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I can't wait for it. Please. I want, yeah. I want more. And he's gonna be in, um, uh, he's gonna be in the Daniel Jose older High Republic Adventures comic. Um, they they released a Ooh, upcoming cover, and Daniel and Jose apparently- older mm. wrote that scary horror like robot droid surgeon guy. Remember? Yep, in last shot. That's, oh yeah, dude. from last shot. Yeah. And also, apparently, uh, Markion has two different masks. So the 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 concept art we've seen that they released before all the book releases. That's his second one that he puts on at the end of this Ooh. book. But he also has a first mask that's more traditionally Nile that's going to be on the cover of High Republic Adventures. So it's it's all connected. Pick up <laughs> the High Republic Adventures number one. It's not just for children who smell delicious. Like, so you can just say whatever you want. <laughs> Oh my word! So we're <laughs> we're pretty much already talking all about Mark and Row, and and you you touched on the hierarchy earlier, Eric, of the Nile, and really we could talk about it, but all of that changes by the end of the novel because yeah, Mark and Row says screw everything, kind of. Um, yeah. It, you know, we know that he is, we don't know that much about him. We know that he's the leader of the Nile because his father, uh, Asgar Rowe, was previously, and they found themselves in charge because they could provide these paths or alternate methods of going through hyperspace. But that yeah. ability actually comes from, uh, is it Ma- is it Mary Santeca or Marie Santeca? I don't, I don't uh, remember. Marie, I Mari? Well, I also Mari? love that, okay. depending so on how you Mari read it. The yeah, there's Mari. Mari, and also I I straight up read uh, Kevin Tar. I'm like that. His name's Kevin. <laughs> his name's for sure Kevin. 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 Chris Elzar man, Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same thing. Very true. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Kevin. Well, ah! we know. <laughs> And he spills a giant he spills a giant pot of chili on his way into the, the office on Hetzel. Oh my God. For my <laughs> office fans out there. Uh, <laughs> all, all the chats like I saw it as Kevin too. It's definitely Kevin. Oh, Kevin. Absolutely. We got it. <laughs> oh, all right, man. Well, what what did y'all make of the fact that these paths actually came from Mari? And do you think that Mari is actually a non chis Skywalker? Oh my oh, god! Oh. Holy, holy shit, Charles! You can't just drop a oh bomb my, like that whoa. on us, bro. <laughs> Your voice didn't change inflection, my guy. <laughs> Where the hell did that <laughs> come <Wow>. from? <gasps> oh my We're god! We're ending strong, y'all. Come back okay, non, to the next A non chis Skywalker, Just, holy crap! That is a hell of a thought right there. That's yeah. amazing. Is that um, what the Santecas are? Is that ooh, worth? Uh, oh my god! You know? Oh, <laughs> well, I, I, uh, you know what, uh, Charles? I think I, I think I speak for all of us when I'm uh, no. Didn't think that. <laughs> that being said, now one bit clearly. Yeah, you know, that that thought occurred to me a couple times. I mean, no big deal. Oh, Cheryl had the thought. Cheryl had the thought in the chat. 100%. Um, Okay. I'm glad glad, glad someone else here is on a a philosophical plane here. Is this this the first time we've heard Santeca outside of The Force Awakens? Outside of Laura Santeca. uh, Oh, I forgot about that. Oh, I didn't didn't make the connection. That's interesting. Yeah. He was in Charles yeah. Soule's uh, comic. Uh, he he uh, hung out with Leia a bit. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So anyway, is Mari basically a Skywalker? <laughs> Holy crap. I think maybe. Wow. Okay. So for the, maybe, the chat, a couple maybe. folks in the chat are asking questions. In the Thrawn books, minor spoilers, uh, in, the, in the Thrawn books, the Chiss don't have like traditional like light speed uh, travel like hyperspace generators yep, and yep. stuff they uh the young chiss that are often female uh they like use the force to navigate hyperspace to to navigate the uh, what's it called the chaos it's out yeah. beyond the outer uh, rim second right second sight they're second yes, sight they call it second sight right right so yeah. um yeah so charles is essentially asking are the santecas and oh. mari i suppose is this some form of that right is this like force wow hyperspace travel i mean it has to be a force power right everything in star wars well, is always explained with the force right that's what it is well, right I think that's, Maybe. that's the great question is that because the, the, the family just knows how to do this 
Because I think Star Wars is also really good at giving us force powers, and then also immediately in, in like introducing a technical thing that can counteract it a little bit. Um, so the family has somehow unlocked hyperspace, like Ke like Kevin. I'm calling him Kevin. Like <laughs> Kevin, um, he says he slices hyperspace. Yes, right? that's how he like, describes with, it. With yeah, so if, if the Santecas have essentially figured out how to do that for generations, like. I, I I think it's she is she is a is a fascinating character, and the fact that she's been building thousands of these things for years gives Markion essentially an unlimited like database of yeah. power. This could like, this could tie in really nicely to the uh, the first order's ability to track through hyperspace too, to tie it all back into the films yeah, and right, stuff. Right, right, right. Hmm. Like we're seeing, I love I love it when technology gets expanded, and like this whole yeah. the whole concept of the paths is really clever and cool because yep. like th they they described hyperspace to us a couple of times in this book, which by the way. Charles Soule, come on, like seriously, describing <laughs> hyperspace in different ways multiple times. What the hell? Like seriously. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Like, Something we just took for granted for years. We're like, yeah, it's hyperspace. You know, it's, you know, we never you thought about it. <laughs> you go fast, right? Like, no, Star Wars hyperspace is really complicated. And, and the way it was yeah. really interesting was described was awesome. But I don't know. I don't yep. know what Mari is. Like, the fact that she's like, centuries old is kind of implied, right? I mean, she's, yeah. how, did it say like how old the other she was? Well, the other Santecas were like, she can't possibly be alive. Which that that whole scene on Naboo. By the way, if you're rich as hell, go retire on the Naboo lakefront. Absolutely, <laughs> it's gorgeous. I think she's uh, like a hundred years old. Yeah, I think she's a little over hundred. You're right. Yeah. But yeah, I love their fear where they're like, no, there's there's no way. And how they ancient. kept playing it close to the vest. I like those two. The other two said Tekas. They, they were they were lots of fun as well. I like yeah, that family. Cool. And speaking of what Corey, what you were saying. Um, so Veles Santeca, one of the one of the uh, Santecas on Naboo. He described hyperspace like hyperspace is not like real space. Once a ship or anything else enters it, there's no way to encounter anything. You're in a bubble of space time that nothing else can interact with because each lane is, as far as we can tell, its own distinct plane of existence. Yes. How do you try to describe hyperspace? Love it. <laughs> it's insane. Yes. I Like, <laughs> listen, like, hyperspace is very complicated it's not nearly in fact like i don't think it has been properly explained like i've seen some like physics like like uh like articles and stuff about like how hyperspace works in different sci-fi like genres mm -hmm. and in star mm -hmm. wars it's not real like you can't describe it because it's not like in star trek it like builds of like an empty dimension around the ship and it moves interdimensionally. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's very nicely described in star Wars. It's not nicely described. Right. And so yeah, yeah. we're still kind of shooting from the hip when it comes to hyperspace. So I loved that. As far as we know, it is not possible to ever run into anything. But they're <laughs> obviously full of crap because apparently, obviously. apparently if you're an old lady that's using the force, you can travel between time and space itself, whatever. Like, yeah. <laughs> And of course, in the chat, it's like hyperspace. Uh, RP Orlando is like hyperspace turning red was terrifying until Kasav drunkenly drives through it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what it was. It was a drunk driver taking a wrong way. That's right. It was a red light, and he just went right through it. <laughs> yes. Oh God. Wow. Well, y'all, I can't think of a better way to kick mm. off next week than to talk about Mark Inroe, what he yeah. did in this novel, and beyond that, what he's maybe planning to do. Uh, but we're going to save all of that for next week. We've got two more whole episodes Ooh. of this roundtable to go, and we've got a lot of great questions and hopefully some good answers coming your way. Yeah. yeah, and gosh, real quick, I thank everyone in the chat, MVPs this week, y'all. Amazing talks. This is so fun. Um, I, uh, I can't wait for next week, um, but we're going to have to, my friends, because <clears throat> that'll do it for this week's episode of The Living Force. <laughs> if you're already supporting us on Patreon, head over to Discord and say thank you to all of us. We will be skipping Aftermath this week. We went a little long. Sorry. <laughs> A special thank you to Cheryl Bell, Patrick Ortiz, and Carl Sander on our Jedi High Council, and Kyle Hickman, Elizabeth Cloutier, Freddie C., and Sally and Chris Eilerson on our Alliance High Command for their amazing support. You can find us on Twitter at Eric Eilerson, at Duck Star Wars MD, at C. Hankel, at Boss Wes. A special thank you to Matt Davenport, our amazing editor, Ryan, our great 
graphic designer extraordinaire, <laughs> and Wes, our producer and community manager. Thank you to Corey, Charles, and West for podcasting with me. Uh, stop and it. As always, Creep me out. May the force be with you. But like, whose line is it anyways when the winner would read the credits? <laughs> <so>. <laughs>